Hey, Danielle, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. That you're, um, you're two for two now with um, being a valued guest here on a Brand Innovators live cast. And this is once again about um, digital and how you've been pivoting in that world. So how was your day so far today? Let's start with the human touch. Thank you. Uh, it's 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 been going well. Speaking of digital, uh, you know, in the last twenty four hours, I've gotten a new iPhone, and so that opened my eyes to how do we keep the customer experience or eye on the customer experience for what happens in our apps when people oh. have to switch phones too. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> been an yes. interesting twenty four hours. Exactly right. Well, I I do want to give everybody a little bit more background on you. Um, I know you through my dear friend, Elise Coben, but um, now the Brand Innovators audience knows you as well from your last round a couple of months ago with us uh, on the Women in QSR Marketing. You can catch that on demand on our uh, fabulous YouTube channel. But when I look back, Danielle, at your storied bio, it's like, I keep thinking of the Johnny Cash song, You've been everywhere, woman. You've been everywhere. <laughs> you, uh, uh, so one example, you went from Petco to Pep Boys, but you started in tech. So what I would love is for you to fill in the blanks of what took you from being like a woman who codes, so to speak, to being an evangelizer of marketing done with a human touch. Let's hear a little bit more about your background. I, I love that tee up and I always tell folks it's uh, <laughs> it's it's my little secret now that I did start my career uh, coding databases. So I can, I can, I don't know if I can do it anymore, but could write some SQL queries with the best of them and, and design large scale databases before right. big data was a cool term. Um, but you know what, starting in that space gives you a focus on how the signals that are in data and how having the customer at the center of everything you do really can power successful business and longstanding brand differentiation and outsized market share growth over competition. And so, you know, that really is kind of the common thread and you're right. I've been in the casino business, worked for Caesars Entertainment for a number of years in the pet space, um, worked for Carl Icahn at, at Pet Boys in the automotive space, and now am in, in the food and beverage space. But the, the thread through that um, is that focus on the customer, is that focus on really classic branding, but classic branding that comes to life mm -hmm. through informed data and analytics, because that's where you really win at the end of the day. And, you know, my first transition from um, con the consulting side and the technology side was two clients of mine. So I went to work for Caesars Entertainment, where I had helped um, Harris and Caesars actually build, and Teradata was a great partner to them in building their loyalty program and the total rewards program, well-recognized, particularly at that point in time, for being a leader in one of the first cross-brand loyalty programs and being able to really create a personalized experience that transcended being on property, being at home, you know, offers that you had from your host, as well as VIP events. And so very well-rounded experiential program, but the entire underpinning of it was data. And it was having knowledge of your customer and being able to make the best offer that's relevant to them. And, you know, you fast forward through, doesn't matter how many years exactly, but you fast forward through a number of years and technology changes. And that strategic underpinning is as true now as it was then. We just have a lot more fantastic tools and precision with which we can put digital and data to work these days. Wow. Uh, so I know that we're going to get to the word fidgetal, which you used uh, before, um, but it sounds like you have really navigated both the physical and the digital and, and all things in between. Will you remind us again, what's your exact role now with Focus Brands? Great question. So I look out for marketing and culinary for our restaurant brands. So mm -hmm. that makes me the senior vice president of marketing for our restaurant brands. And that includes the, the culinary team, you know, in our business, obviously what you're uh, serving to customers is absolutely core to that experience. And so that's Moe's, McAllister's and Schlotzky's within our portfolio of brands. Great. I'm glad that we got those brand names out there. We are, after all, brand 
innovators. Uh, I know I couldn't, I will, I will be transparent. I did not have time to put the brand innovators background up. And so I was, I'm taking the shameless opportunity to have Moe's and Schlotsky's in the background here. <laughs> That's perfect. You're walking the walk, my friend. That's fine. Um, so what we want to talk about today is, um, you know, this is titled uh, adopting to a data deprived future. So tell us what it means um, with all of the impending regulations and requirements changing that takes us from and to a data deprived future, first party, third party. Give us a little layperson explanation of that. You know, it, it's it brings up such a great question because you hear these terms that sound a little cataclysmic, right? And they sound very scary of we're, you know, cookie deprecation and we're gonna be in a cookie-less future. And what does that mean? We're not gonna have data available. There will be changes, 100% there's gonna be changes. And those that are most prepared for those changes are gonna be most successful, but we're not gonna be in a data deprived future. It's just a different data future, right? And, and I think, that's where you have to look at how you intersect, what you can gather on your own customers, what your first party data is the term, right? But, but the simple way of thinking about first party data means what relationship can you build with your own customers and what reasons can you give them to share some of that data with you, to join a loyalty program, to provide information on their preferences. And then you have to be able to keep and store that and be prepared to use it to personalize the experience with the guests. It's very much a two-way dialogue with them, but that's the concept of first-party data. And the more you do that, the easier it becomes to tie that to behavior that happens you know, outside of your stores or online outside of your digital properties, because there are ways to intersect that first-party data and sort of find those customers in a privacy safe way in that infrastructure out of your own properties. And, and I think that's gonna be such a critical component of the future. Um, and the other aspect of that is there are big providers out there and Google's at the top of that list who, while they are, you know, respecting privacy in the sense of not sharing their users data outside of themselves, there's a tremendous amount that Google knows within their property and ecosystems. And that's a large part of, you know, the United States and, and really users globally that interact in that Google ecosystem, which means you still have a lot of the ability as a marketer to, to serve up and to target content in, you know, you'll hear a term like walled gardens and, and Google's mm -hmm. one example. There's several others, obviously Facebook and Meta is another example of that where they're trying to do the same thing, build that relationship with those customers, have the trust. But the reality is, as a marketer, you can work with each of those partners and, and be able to still serve up a tailored experience too. It's just going to be different than in the past where you could look more universally using third-party cookies. So I'm going to keep it at the treetops for a second. Um, you famously have always talked about the fact that we have to blend of what we call brand and demand. But first party data really starts with gaining trust of the brand and agreeing to give up your personal information. Are there some examples of how you've navigated that? How do you get the focus brand, various restaurant customers to agree to offer up that data and allow you to reach out to them directly? You know, it's it's multiple layers to that. So, you know, there's there's rewarding them. I mean, mm. consumers understand that, you know, there's there's that relationship piece of, hey, if I'm going to give you a reward, and whether that's something you build to in a loyalty program or something immediate like a free tea or a free cup of queso in our world, you know, that's something where consumers then have the opportunity to weigh that. Hey, yes, I want to sign up and engage in your loyalty program because for me, a free queso has a huge value add. It's also a fun, unique part of the Moe's brand. And so it makes sense to them to provide that information, but you can't stop there because that might be something that becomes transactional if you don't follow up with the customer. So, you know, you stick on that Moe's example, free queso when you sign up for our loyalty program. That's something that we market um, in digital media. It's something that we have the messaging available in store. We encourage our team members to be able to have that conversation with customers. But again, you don't stop there. Then it's the follow-up communications to, you know, provide 
value on here's the overall Moe's brand. Here's some of our upcoming, you know, specials or promotions. Oh, here's just a really cool and fun way to engage you with a brand like Moe's, give you some behind the scenes content because the experiential stuff is just as, as important. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you have to provide value to customers to get them to provide that data. Some of it, and oftentimes to get someone to sign up for a loyalty program, there's first immediate benefit to that, right? Something that you can um, redeem and has value to you pretty quickly as a customer and a high enough perceived value as a customer. But then it really is, do I value these communications I'm getting from you? And, you know, am I going to still, you know, be paying attention to you as a brand in that? And so that's the next step is to start to use those signals. If you come in and that first experience, you're purchasing kids meals and a main entree. Well, now I know that you're a parent with children. So maybe I follow up with another offer that gives you a discount off of a kid's meal or a free kid's meal when you purchase an entree. Or maybe I provide you some value added content about you know, kids in the community and talk about how we sponsor you know, local baseball teams. So it's about using that data to continue to give customers a reason to share more with you and stay in that relationship with you. So true customization. And, and I will point out that I do work for cheese. So I, I, you can have my data for that case. So I'm good. You with know, that. I, I would make this argument and obviously I might be a little biased, but I truly think it's, it's correct. Moe's has the best queso in the, in the business. Okay. She's working the brand on the brand innovator <laughs> side again. That's good. That's fine. <laughs> um, so, all right, now we have created trust. We have captured that data. And now you have to kind of do two things. You have to make sure that you have enough. So you're trying to build the scale of that. And I guess, you know, working with the meta, the Googles, the whatever. Um, but also you have to customize um, and, and sort of customize locally at scale, I guess we would say. How do you approach hyper-personalization, parsing out that data? What do you use and, and how have you evolved your techniques these days? And, you know, I'll start with examples on some of our digital properties. And, and the first important thing to say is you're never done. The, the importance of that personalization is having an agile mindset and continuing to learn from what your customers are teaching you, their changing needs, and quite frankly, what's working and what's not. You know, it's, it's, it needs to be something where you're actively engaged and continuing to evaluate what should I be doing different? What can I do next? Um, one of the ways that we engage in that hyper-personalization in the digital space is something um, that we, we've chosen to call, and it's definitely, you know, an industry term to our marketing term is customer lifetime value optimization or mm -hmm. CLTV. And so what that basically means is use that data and use those signals and also test out different offers and different creative, what works best. And so sometimes that's delivered via email. Sometimes that's delivered when you're on the website and you're getting ready to check out what's my personalized suggestive sell item that I'm going to provide to you, right? And so sometimes I'm reaching out to you when you're not in a purchase engagement. And that's, for example, via email. And I'm, I'm trying to give you a reason to come in and choose Moe's for your dining option to stick mm -hmm. on the Moe's example this week. Other times you're on the site and I want to, you know, incent an add-on or give you something that's customized. But if I, if I guess wrong or I present you something that's not relevant to you, then not, not only might you not buy that, but it really might turn you off from that entire transaction. So we use data and those signals in those two examples of what's the best offer that's gonna be relevant to you. And that's that customer lifetime value optimization and proactively using channels like email or push messaging in the app to deliver that. But then also when you're on the site, what can I do to make that experience feel more personalized? And, you know, we, we are, we are not, you know, at the end state of that journey. Again, I'd say we're, we're learning, we're cultivating, and there's always opportunity for more, but it's one of the key components of Focus Brands Roadmap mm -hmm. over the next two to three years is to continue to roll those things out across all of our brands and make them more and more robust so that you have thousands and thousands of those offer permutations and you pick the right one for the right customer at the right time. Well, you teed me up perfectly um, to ask you again about what made news just a couple of months ago and two months in um, since coming out with the claim that you would 
um, envision that 50% of your sales would be digitally driven by 2027. How are you since coming out with that um, vision for Focus Brands Restaurants? I love it. Being metrics driven, you got to say, how are we tracking, right? And you're, and you're yeah, paying attention that's the to the stats. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the first key things that we're really working with a lot of our franchisees, and you mentioned locally too, and so this mm -hmm. is down to the team members in the store. This brings together local and the fidgetal piece because we have to have the team members and our franchisees really understanding the importance of building towards that digital future because they're a huge gateway to getting our customers um, to enroll in the loyalty program, which is the first part of creating that flywheel for how we can do these personalized offers. So happy to say um, that that is well underway and we've seen significant increases in most of our brands in the amount of loyalty signups and loyalty penetration. So the amount of folks within any given store that are using the loyalty program, um, we've, we've definitely seen strong, strong growth in all of our brands over the last couple months. And that's wonderful because it says we're providing that right value to customers to sign up. We're getting our team members excited and engaged and they believe there's a reason to talk to their customers about that. And so um, very, very strong kind of first component is getting that loyalty engagement. And then also we, um, in a couple of our key brands, uh, McAllister is an example of this where we've really leaned into testing um, probably 50 different at this point permutations of those customer lifetime value offers to get those those learnings. Um, and again, you're you're learning, you're adapting, and we have agile sprints along the way that bring those things to life. Well, that's not just A B testing. That's A B twice and squared. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's when you understand why machine learning is a real thing. Is uh, when you start getting to that math. Yes. <laughs> well, yes, which I failed. Um, several times in school, which also tees me up now to ask you about the other side of things, because again, you have talked about the need to balance the data, the tech, your roots with marketing, uh, so performance and brand awareness. Um, and it sounds like you're really recruiting your franchisees and your staff to be human, but how do you balance that with this goal to be half digital um, in just a couple of years? You know, that's where the magic gets created is those two things work together. I think I've said to you before, um, one of my personal pet peeves in marketing is things are teed up as an or choice. Are you doing digital yeah. or traditional? Are you doing branding or digital? And that's personally my view not the right way to be thinking about it. Our job as marketers is to be doing both in an integrated way because the customer is receiving all of that at once. And you cannot just have a transactional relationship with your customers. You have to have that emotional component and you have to be differentiated. You have to be creative. You have to break through and that has to sit together. So I'll give you a McAllister's example. Um, sweet tea is one of the most famous properties for McAllister's. When you kind of look at a brand, you say, what's your equity, right? And, and for McAllister's, it is tea, hands down, proprietary blend, customers love it. We have signature cups. It just has a huge legacy and a lot of brand equity. Um, and so you find yourself thinking, well, you know, how do you continue to take that to the next level? And what do you do that combines the physical and the digital? So McAllister's um, has, has just run a, it's, it's more than a promotion, it's a program where we partnered with an ice cream um, creator and Cream Malicious, and they created a sweet tea ice cream. So now you have something that's completely custom. We don't typically in McAllister's sell ice cream, mm -hmm. but let's create a sweet tea ice cream that brings us into a whole new product line, completely relevant for summer, gives you exclusivity where you have the ability to tell your customers, you've never tasted anything like this before, come into McAllister's, um, gave us a great opportunity to have a large PR push, you know, billions and billions of impressions from a PR standpoint. And 
you tied some of the benefits in trying it to being a member of the loyalty program. So it goes back to, again, that formula of you got to give customers a benefit and you have to still do that creative breakthrough thinking. And so now you've created a program that increases our loyalty signups and personalization, ties it to that data-driven digital experience, but is very rooted in driving traffic to the store and something that's breakthrough and unique to the brand. And are you continuously looping that, like uh, sort of a silly example, but did you do any kind of polling to determine what would be your favorite flavor? And are you, you know, bringing in your social media strategy and, and all of that to connect all the dots? Absolutely. Um, you know, and we do we do that feedback from our customers in a couple of different ways. Um, it is honestly another benefit that customers see in, in having a relationship with us um, mm -hmm. back to that first party data, because we'll reach out and ask them. We do it in surveys. We'll survey some of our most frequent guests. Um, you know, we'll reach out after you come in and visit us and, and include some questions in a post visit survey because we want to engage people. And it is, it is amazing. This, I, it's part of this is industry and part of it is our brands. Um, but people really, really feel passionate about the food and they, you know, feel like it's my McAllister's or it's my Moe's mm -hmm. and the amount of responses we get when we reach out to our database of customers is, is actually amazing. Within a couple hours, we'll have way more than enough sample size to make some key decisions on things because people want to give their opinion. And, you know, to your point, we then parlay that into, into social. So I think you'll see a continued explosion in social. We use, um, you know, outlets like TikTok very effectively, particularly mm -hmm. in, in some of our brands on the specialty side of the business. Auntie Anne, Cinnabon have fantastic presence there. Um, we're growing that more and more on the restaurant side because again, customers want to interact and that's another way that you can get that feedback and you can build that relationship. A absolutely. And I, um, I'm among those who likes to share her opinion. <laughs> We, we feel empowered. And I love that you give your customers the, the platform, the sort of dais to be able to share that. Um, and apparently they're feeling heard, which I think is, is a key part. Um, so, all right, you're a big organization. You know, we know historically that sales and marketing or data and creative were we're always trying to weave together those several departments. How do you balance creative and data without one strong arming the other? Ah, you know, it's always a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> you mean not I, texting. <laughs> I, right. I, I think, you know, it's, it's two pieces and, and, and they're critical. One is is the process, quite frankly. You've got to bring people together in those ideation sessions. And so we've invested a lot as we're starting, you know, if you back up the marketing planning cycle and you're, you're farther out in your planning and we're really thinking about what do we want to bring to market for a particular brand six months from now or a year from now, you have those multiple voices in the room at the same time. And you have, you know, both the quantitative data and the insights and qualitative data about your customers. So you have the customer sitting at the table with you. Um, you also have the finance piece, right? Because we need to look out at the end of the day, we're driving demand generation. And in our business, our job is to help the franchisees achieve their livelihood goals, right? We've got to drive profitable traffic to, to our restaurants. So you have to have you know, your sales and, and traffic goals sitting there with you. But you also have to have the creative and the branding and, you know, where are we going to win? Where are we unique from competition? How do we facilitate those brainstorming sessions that we're, now we're clear in our financial objectives and opportunities? Now let's make the space to have the creative discussion and the creative brainstorming of what's our central idea, what's our big idea that can help deliver on those financial pieces. So we've invested significantly in um, that process, really working the process and making sure that we're starting from the intersection of both of those things equally, which is what are the financials we need to drive for the business and you know, the underpinnings of that sitting right next to what's the long-term brand equity and how do we need to continue to differentiate ourselves uh, from the competition? I, you know, Danielle, I just have to sidebar and say, hearing you speak the enormity of a role like yours um, to oversee all aspects of this and, and you know, 
put it through the sieve and come out with the proper mix is, is really remarkable. And, and my hat's off to you. Um, I also know that it's not so easy to find talent these days um, with our current job market and things like that. And as you talk about the right messaging, conversely, we also need to have more diverse voices in the room. So I'm going to throw you a curveball um, and just ask you, how do you apply you know, data and creative to soliciting new voices? And how are you also appealing to diverse customer ears? Great question. You know, and a lot of that starts with the communities we serve, and it starts with um, us internally as an organization and valuing diversity. And so, you know, to the communities we serve, our customer bases are, are very diverse. You know, within a brand, there's diversity, certainly in some cases by geography or location. But on the whole, we have, you know, a lot of diversity and we have to continue to honor that and cultivate it and do our best to make sure we reflect the diversity that exists in the communities that we serve. And that's super important to, to focus brands. And so on that internal piece, again, there's always more work to be done, but we, you know, we have employee engagement groups and really continuing to, to cultivate that. One of my favorite is um, the uh, Asian American and Pacific Islanders uh, group, but just to be a part of that team and in conversations with that employee resource group, the passion, um, the pride and, and what they bring to the entire dialogue is absolutely inspiring to watch. So we're continuing to invest in those employee resource groups. It's important for us as we're looking for talent. It's important for us as we're looking for vendors. We just um, completed a, a media RFP for all seven of our brands. And in that, front and center is diversity and making sure that the suppliers we're partnering with have a clear strategy, not words on paper, but things mm -hmm. you can demonstrate around that diversity because it all goes back to serving diverse communities and that we need to do our best to, to continue to reflect that and empower the people at a local level um, to reflect what's relevant for their communities. Well said. And, and by the way, the human side, again, is who wouldn't want to work for you? So... <laughs> Uh, so you've talked about taking a holistic view across all brands, but you also have to sort of amplify the individuality of one. Do you bring all of your data together so that you have more scale? Are you using or employing different tech for one brand over the other? How do you um, differentiate and sort of make things universal at the same time? Oh, you know, that, that is the continual balancing act. Um, and it's what is the, the power and the opportunity for a portfolio company like ours. So the, mm -hmm. the opportunity and the power is to be able to say to our franchisees, if, you know, you invest in opening stores with us, you're going to get something that your brand alone quite honestly, would not be able to afford, right? We, we can build these platforms and have a significant amount of scale, both talent, technology, investment, processes that you couldn't get if you were investing in a brand of a similar size that was standalone um, because you can't afford to carry all of that on the P&L. Your, your ad fund, your, your, your budgets aren't going to support that. But you plug into this engine and you're going to get these world-class platforms that help you punch above your weight and level up versus your competitors in, in your local market. And so it's a very compelling opportunity for, for franchisees. For us on the execution side of that, then it's it's about being crystal clear. You know, mm -hmm. in, in media, for example, every brand, all seven, have their own dedicated media plan. Um, they have, you know, clearly their own audiences that are defined and objectives that are defined based upon that brand's unique value proposition and positioning and menu and customer relationships and experience in the store. However, we leverage the scale. So, you know, when you're having a conversation with some of the larger media providers, you're doing it across the entire portfolio. So you're getting better rates and, and preferential treatment. When we're thinking about the approach to constructing a media plan and to measuring media, that's consistent across all of them because that's how you best leverage, you know, the data science and analytics. So it's about deploying that scale where it makes sense and where it pluses up the brand, but having also an, an 
absolute laser focus on making sure those brands keep their differentiation in the customer experience, in their brand positioning, and in their menu. Thank you. Um, I only have two more questions for you, but I wanted to just give everybody the opportunity to use the chat little icon at the bottom if you have um, a remaining burning question for Danielle Parra of uh, Focus Brands. Um, and what the heck was I going to ask you? Um, Hopefully not which food is my favorite, because that's like picking <laughs> your, your favorite child. I cannot do no. that in any public forum. <laughs> we know it's queso and sweet tea, though. Um, <laughs> Um, I wanted to go back to the definition of, <clears throat> excuse me, fidgetal and just sort of circle back for a period at the end of the sentence about your digital goals and how you see those two things balancing the value prop to customers um, versus the need that we all have to be in touch and in person. Um, can you paint a picture for us of? you know, what that might look like for both sides of the coin for the customer? Absolutely. And I'm going to do it to you again of saying tie it together. So the reason the yeah. digital piece and, and the way we think about it is creating the most meaningful, personalized experience for the customer that adds value to their daily life. And that when we lay out our customer journeys, we're stitching it together honestly, even when they're not engaged with us, what are they doing when they're home? What mindsets are they in? You know, what challenges are they facing? Are they someone who's now come back to an office and they're looking for lunch solutions? Are they someone who's in an office and need a catering solution? Are they a busy family who around 4 p.m. today is going to need to figure out what to, to feed everyone at home? And so we, we think about that entire vigil experience, the customer service experience, starting with what problems can we best solve for customers mm -hmm. and how do we present that to them in a way that's personalized and relevant to them. And so, you know, that drives our, our marketing agenda from what message are we gonna give you at what time of day based on what signals we know about you. Like I said, if you're a business person at lunch versus a family looking for a dinner solution. Um, and it also drives above that, how we're designing our stores. So for instance, Schlotzky's newest store prototype is Design 1000. It's a small, small footprint, but two drive-throughs meant to facilitate, again, as we've thought about that customer mm -hmm. journey, well, now we're gonna have more digital, we need to, and we're gonna have third-party mm -hmm. delivery drivers, get them through, but keep that drive-through customer who just got the message popped on, on their ways that there's a Schlotzky's drive-through, we gotta make sure we're, we're there to serve them too. And if you have someone who wants to come dine in, we still have that dining experience. And so it, it really permeates everything from the marketing all the way through to the store prototype designs coming from the perspective of putting yourself in your customer's shoes. I think that's such a fascinating example. I never thought about how your digital footprint impacts your physical real store footprint and the considerations that you have to have as you shift strategies that even back to the kitchen thinking. even designing back to the new kitchen. kitchen equipment and lines to be able to wow. service that it's it's it, it, there there is no separation uh between the yeah. two and that's that's why the physical physical piece you hear me keep talking about because yeah. if you stop with just one or the other the customer experience isn't where it needs to be Maddie, welcome back. I'm going to ask Danielle one last burning question yeah, that I no have. Rush. Um, I have to mention, though, I'm so hungry and Auntie Anne's <laughs> my favorite. So um, this is like it the works for queso also. <laughs> so it wouldn't help for me to describe the smells I'm having from the test kitchen. Uh, no, don't, 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 because that's <laughs> going to make it worse. But no, Evie, okay. go ahead. Yeah. She's a brand marketer from way back now. She's, you know, enveloping all of our senses. Pretty soon she's going to hold up a cup of queso. I haven't figured out how to get the scent to come through the computer screen yet. That, my <laughs> friend, EB, there you go. That is truly the intersection. We need that. <laughs> well, that actually also tees up, sweet tees up my last question, which is about media and where we're going, because that reminds me of that attempt to do like smell o vision and theaters and things like that. So assuming we can't do that, where are you shifting from and to as you embrace that 2027 goal of 50% of sales coming from digital? You know, it's, it, 
depends on the brand because it depends on, on, you know, what we need to accomplish in the brand equity space. We're trying to change preference or perception, you know, we're trying to get awareness, but the reality is some of the, the, the larger opportunities and for brands like us, right? Look, we, we do not have, you know, upfront level, you know, media spend pieces. So things like, you know, traditional linear TV and audio don't make sense for us. Mm -hmm. However, there's so much opportunity in OTT TV and, and a lot of the, you know, tailored digital audio components, we're still getting that experience. We were able to do the storytelling and you're able to do that in an efficient way that makes sense because you can also target it only around the radius of the stores where you're located if you're not truly a national brand. So those are the things of the future is finding those ways that you can accomplish that classic need for, for storytelling, the classic need for building that brand equity, but do it in a realistic way for your budget and for you know, the location of, of your business. And so those are some of the key opportunities you know, we see there. A lot of it on um, organic social. So you have organic and paid social. The two have to work together. There's absolutely a pay for play approach there, but the stronger you are in the content you're putting out, you know, the better the impact. And, and that's where for us, we've, we've seen that. I mean, to absolutely fanatical fan levels on TikTok with, you know, a Cinnabon and an Auntie Anne's as, as we're putting product yeah. out there, or we're telling some behind the scenes stories. And so I think you know, it's, it's creating that ecosystem. Um, Moe's just did a spicy shack. So we had spicy chicken. We actually partnered with an Airbnb um, host and decked out an entire Airbnb in Miami. Cause we're also, you're going to do something spicy, but Miami makes total sense. Oh my. We did spicy shack. So you can reserve it. So tremendous amount of PR coverage, but it also fed organic social. And it also tied into our paid media communications as well. Wow. Oh, okay. That was very meaty. For a last question, <laughs> the way you answered it, I love that. Thank you so much. And um, Danielle, I'm going to put you on the spot and hope that you're going to join us in person since I've seen you on screen virtually twice. Let me take you from the digital to the physical and please join us at our um, New York Media Buying Summit coming up in October. I hope I'll see you there. <laughs> 